Councilwoman Porter, you still there? Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you, Mr. Chair. That's all right. And that, uh, we have Councilman Mark Conway is just on. He's one of the council people in the district. Also, Thank Jamal you, Simpson from Councilman Glover's office, who is not going to be here out sick. So, Jamal, thank you. Um, also, Daria Brown from from President's office. Also, um, thank you. Nina, I'm sorry, Nina Thimlis from the Mayor's office. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And a great committee person here, Marguerite Kern. Thank you so much. Before I go through the, I'm also here, Mr. Chair. This is Councilman Cohen. Oh, okay. Thank you, Councilman. Appreciate it from the first district. Um, I'm also from uh, District Eight as well, Mr. Chair. Sorry, okay. Thank you. Connection. Yeah. Thank you, Councilman, from the eighth district. I want to real quick say we want to start at five. Hopefully, we'll finish at seven. So we want to be um, respectful of everybody's time, and we want to make sure our our young people get an opportunity to speak because it really affects them the most. So what I want to do is first, mute yourself, just for speakers and panelists. Mute yourself when you're not speaking. Identify yourself before you speak. Speak slowly and clearly. After you finish speaking, please mute yourself again until you're asked to speak again. This is the oversight hearing for the Baltimore City Children and Youth Fund which is coming before this committee and the city council to get an update on the status or activities associated with the fund. Um, Mrs. Dion Cartwright, who is the chairperson for the Baltimore City Youth Fund, I'll ask her to introduce her leadership team and speakers. Uh, thank you, Mr. Stokes. Hi, everyone. My name is Dion Cartwright and I am the chair of the transition board of the Baltimore Great Children Youth Fund. Um, before I introduce the um, other speakers, would you like me to go ahead and move forward with my uh, talking points, sir? One moment, let me, let me introduce Councilman Torrance, who is a part of the committee from the seventh district. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Ms. Carwright, you can start. Okay, thank you. Um, so again, I'm the chair of the, of the transition board of the Baltimore Children and Youth Fund. I am also a resident of Baltimore City. I have been engaged in supporting Baltimore communities since 2001 and have spent over 20 years in the philanthropic sector, working to support low income communities and people of color through neighborhood grant making and leadership development, both locally and nationally. Uh, making a commitment to BCYF was important to me because of my love for Baltimore neighborhoods and its people. For 15 years, I worked at a local foundation that afforded me the opportunity to work with community residents to address issues they identified as critical to the success of their neighborhoods. I brought a resident-centered grassroots approach to grant making that was rooted in advancing racial equity, a strategy that many philanthropic institutions avoid even today. The Baltimore Children and Youth Fund's commitment to creating new opportunities for the city's young people to learn, thrive, and succeed completely aligns with my own values, both personally and professionally. The fact that we are guided by core values of racial equity, community ownership, intergenerational leadership, and collective decision making makes me proud to serve on this transition board and proud to sit as the chair. I am one of eight BCYF transition board members that fully represent Baltimore and our beautiful and unique communities. Collectively, this board has decades of experience and demonstrated substantial commitments to the residents of the city through their own, through our own uh, community engagement efforts, including working or volunteering with local nonprofit organizations and community-based programs and, a and a demonstrated commitment to Baltimore's children and youth. Um, in addition to myself, transition board members include Catherine Benton Jones, Earl El Amin, Erica Seth Davies, Jackie Caldwell, John Morris, Julia Baez, and Kirsten Allen. We are committed to working together to transition BCYF into a thriving organization that continues to grow, improve, and support organizations that are vital to meeting the needs of Baltimore's children and youth. For too long, the public, private, and philanthropic sectors have failed to adequately invest 
in Baltimore's people and communities of color, leading to disparities in many outcomes. In response, BCYF is committed to centering racial equity in everything we do. That includes funding and providing hands-on support to nurture Black-led community organizations and supporting high-quality programming for children and youth of color who have been left out in the past. We need support from the community and many other stakeholders to continue to build something that can have a truly transformative impact on Baltimore. You will now hear from Davon Love and other members of the BCYF team who will provide an update on our grant making and operational work as we continue the creation of a strong institution that lives its values. Thank you. All right, uh, uh, Chairman Stokes, is it okay for me to proceed? Yes, could, could you just introduce your team or your um, um, panelists? Absolutely. Um, so my name is so my name is Davon Love. I'm on the community engagement and communications team at the Baltimore City Children and Youth Fund, and uh, my primary co-presenter will be Kira Ritter, who's the transition manager um, for this effort. Um, before we before we delve into um, this presentation, um, just a few just just uh, introductory remarks I want to make to kind of set the context for this. The first is that tonight will be the first time that a lot of the information that we're going to present has been presented to the public. We're excited about the information that we're going to share that I think the council in the city of Baltimore should be proud of. I want to remind the council that in, in previous iterations of the Baltimore City Children and Youth Fund, um, the, the, the team has presented information about the activities of many of the programs that have been funded and supported by the Youth Fund and have given some examples that again, I think the, that the council and the city should be proud of. And if the council wishes to be, uh, re, uh, wishes to receive that information again, um, and for the new council members to provide that information to folks that may not have been serving on the council back then, we'll provide that information as well. We think that you'll find the consistent progress um, of the work that we've done over time um, will be satisfactory to you. Um, and then lastly, just in terms of introductory, we're going to provide over the coming days and weeks um, additional information that gives a comprehensive look at a variety of important questions that people will have about the Baltimore City Children and Youth Fund. We're going to, again, share some of that today, um, but to talk about in terms of some of the impact that many of these programs have had, to talk about some of the demographic of the information, some information about the, uh, the participants, some of the programming the Youth Fund has done, um, there's going to be more comprehensive information that will be, be made available to the, to the council and to the public. Um, so just wanted to say at the, at the top, um, so as I, as I mentioned, Kira Ritter, the transition manager, her and I are going to um, go through this, uh, this, these slides um, that provide this information. Um, so I'll kick it to, to Kira and her and I will just be presenting on the various slides. Thank you, Davon. Good evening, Councilman Stokes, other members of the committee. All right. Starting back with our story, many of us would think back to 2017 when the youth fund started. There was a task force that was put together to talk about what the youth fund really should be and what it should look like. We were all in agreement that the city's grant making structures and systems often don't meet the needs of community. The question was, how do we operationalize this new entity called the Youth Fund? We didn't want to repeat what was already out there. So how do we start anew and facilitate the radical shift in grant making? We knew that there would need to be a temporary intermediary to manage the funds and that we would want to create a permanent organization to sustain the work of the fund that was rooted in racial equity. Associated Black Charities was elected to serve, was selected to serve in that role in the initial iteration under the leadership of President and CEO Diane Bell McCoy. They were the only foundation in the Baltimore region with an explicit focus on racial equity, which is what everyone agreed should be front and center as part of the Children and Youth Fund. In November of 2017, City Council authorized ABC to serve as the fund's interim intermediary and to spend up to 
of the youth funds to support the administrative cost of administering grant dollars to grassroots organizations, city organizations serving children, youth, and young adults, and to provide technical assistance to those organizations. That technical assistance piece was critical. This is part of what differentiates BCYF from other grant making institutions that are out there. It really is about us being a community resource and supporting those who are providing programming in ways that they haven't been supported through traditional philanthropy. So I'm gonna talk about the ordinance that authorized the Baltimore City and Baltimore City Children and Youth Fund to be an independent entity. So as Kira mentioned, um, the, the job that Associated Black Charities was given was to incubate the development of an independent institution um, that could do the innovative approaches to grant making um, that was authorized both by the task force that was convened in 2017 and voted on by the city council as a part of the ordinance that authorized the work to begin. So what I wanna do is talk a little bit about the ordinance um, from about April or May of 2020 um, and its components that I think are particularly important in understanding how it is structured. So the legislation that was passed by the city council um, in 2020 does a few things. Um, first, what it did was it established a transition board. Um, as, as we mentioned, the, in, in order to be able to transition the work from ABC to an independent entity, um, we needed a transition board to help shepherd the process of transitioning um, both the, the 78 or 77 or so uh, organizations and the work to manage those for, that portfolio into um, the current entity. Um, so we needed a transition board to help shepherd along that process, as well as to help develop the infrastructure needed um, to build the institution to be at its full capacity. Additionally, the Baltimore City Children Youth Fund is subject to all um, necessary city audits and public information laws. Um, that's particularly important because one of the things that we know has been um, something that's been a particular, particularly important to the general public has been uh, making sure that there's access to transparent information about what is happening with the Baltimore City and Children and Youth Fund. Um, it authorized, so, so remember, this was during the, around the beginning of the emergence of the pandemic. And so the last administration um, had actually asked that the Youth Fund in fiscal years 2019 and 2020 and 2019, that dollars be made available um, for direct food assistance and for computers for virtual learning. Um, and so there was a provision that made sure that only those fiscal years dollars would be used for emergency funds to protect the youth fund and being able to act autonomously in the way that the task force guidelines um, have dictated. Additionally, it said an administrative cap. The administrative cap is particularly important. And I wanna make sure that we clear up both for the council and for those that are viewing is that the administrative cap is about the amount of money, the percentage of the money that can be used to operate the institution. And that's particularly important. Um, John Brothers, who's the president of T. Rowe Price Foundation, has said on numerous occasions that um, administrative fees are normally about 25% for a fully healthy and functional um, institution. And so the admin cap, if you include the administrative cap, which is 15%, and then another 5% for public engagement, that's a total of about 20% that can be spent on activities to help operationalize all that is needed to push our grants. Also, um, what this did, what the uh, ordinance did was it set out um, the composition of the permanent board. So the transition board will serve via the ordinance um, until December 31st of 2021. After they have served, there will be a permanent board um, that will then be seated. That permanent board will be comprised of at least one third youth. It will have designees from the finance department and the law department as non-voting members. It will include um, a male designee from the mayor's office of family and children's success and a designee from the Baltimore city council. So, so those are some of the, the guidelines requirements that have been laid out for the board composition for the Baltimore city children at UFI. Right, next slide. So in July 1, 
2020, which is when BCYF Inc. was named the permanent intermediary for the city's Children and Youth Fund, we absorbed a slate of grantees that were already mid-cycle. Mid and so there needs to be a team to manage the portfolio, but also build the institution. One of the challenges that existed prior to July was during the incubation stage, there needed to be a team that moved the project forward after the transition. And so what we have is a team that's managing grantees and that's building that permanent infrastructure. Anyone who has run an organization knows that this is critical. Things don't happen on their own, they're not magic. And so it was about creating many of the systems, processes, tools, platforms, policies, that will make BCYF what we all envisioned it to be. This is the transition team. There is a transition board. We've already met the chair, Dion Cartwright. She talked about the other seven members of the board. There is an executive team that is responsible and oversees strategy management and implementation. There's a program team and a technical assistance team that together not only support this current portfolio of grantees, but that are planning and learning from others who have done this work in an equitable way, which is not how the majority of grant making is done in this country, but is applying those learnings to how BCYF moves forward as a community resource. And there is an operations team, your back office team that makes things happen on a day-to-day -day basis and ties it all together and community engagement and communications. Again, what makes BCYF different is the involvement of community throughout all aspects of the organization. All right, so this is a, a video um, and I hope that we're able to get the sound. This is just to give you an introduction to some of the programming that's been supported um, by the Baltimore City Children Youth Fund. Hopefully this works. Baltimore's children and young adults are our treasure and our future. Our goal for the Baltimore Children and Youth Fund really is to support children and young adults and really provide them with the resources and the tools that are needed to be successful. Thanks to the Youth Fund, more than 80 organizations are helping young people to explore fun in new ways, whether it's science experiments or dance or even learning about their heritage and photography. The Youth Fund is a Black-led organization that supports other Black-led organizations because they often get overlooked. They often receive fewer resources. For too long, systemic racist policies and practices have deprived the Black community of resources for young people. The Baltimore Children and Youth Fund is working to undo this historic disparity by investing in high quality programming for children and youth across Baltimore. We wanna invest with community, we wanna partner with community and really hear from community about what they need, what they feel like is important to the advancement of their neighborhoods, of their organizations. And we do more than make grants. Our team provides hands-on support to organizations, whether it's giving them assistance for writing reports, advice on expanding their fundraising. We need to create a new Baltimore, a Baltimore where all people matter, a Baltimore where young people are heard, their visions are explored, and that they are able to thrive. That's what we hope. That's what I hope for the Baltimore Children and Youth Fund. We want to help kids today and build a stronger network of community organizations for years to come. When we are investing in culturally responsive youth programming and giving Baltimore's youth true opportunities to thrive, we will know we are successful in fulfilling our mission. The Youth Fund has a bright future. We will watch with pride as our young people tap into their curiosity and their talents and fulfill their awesome pride.
All right, so what we're going to do is we're going to address some key questions that we imagine that the council and the general public has about the Baltimore City Children and Youth Fund. Um, really, the purpose of the video there is to just give some narrative about the impact that the Baltimore City Children and Youth Fund has already had. Already had. Um, what we'll do is these are some of the key questions that we're going to address, um, and we're going to go through each of these um, in more depth um, that we think is going to be important for the general public to know about the work that's been happening. And Mr. Love, is those are those the questions that I actually emailed to you? You talking about? They include they include some of the questions that you, that you sent to okay. us. Right. Next slide. Okay. So, who is the Baltimore Children and Youth Fund currently funding? We know that in year one. There were 84 grantees that were named by the grant review panel, which was comprised of Baltimore residents. And that in that first year, all of those grantees did not have a full year to amply demonstrate what they could do. There were some challenges around folks getting um, meeting the compliance requirements all of managing public funds. And so we wanted to give them an opportunity to continue with a full deployment in one year. So we're now in the second year. Uh, we have grantees that have received a continuation grant. There are 79 of those uh, projects and organizations that are currently in our portfolio, serving a projected uh, 20,418 youth. And the reason that it's projected is because the grant cycle does not end until tomorrow. And there are some grantees that are going to have an extension. So we won't know the total number of youth served until after. But we're clearly talking about more than 20,000 youth that are being reached by these various organizations. Combined, they will have received approximately $9.2 million in this round of funding. The grant cycle began February of 2020. And so the disbursements were done between Associated Black Charities and Baltimore Children and Youth Fund, Inc. Next slide. So these, these are some highlights, some information that I think um, to take from some of the deeper data that we're going to go into in, so, in some of the slides that will come in a moment. Um, but I really want Baltimore to look at the data before you and be clear that this is really cutting edge when it comes to building an institution that actually invests in the people of the community to do the work for and of the community. So nationwide, through philanthropic, only three percent of philanthropic dollars go to people of led, uh, people of color led organizations. BCYF shared us that it's sixty five percent of the organizations fund are that are funded are led by folks of color. Um, that's important. We don't know of any other grant making institution in the region that can probably say that they that their portfolio is a majority black. This is representative of our city in a way that's very important. Not only that, but the majority of the workforce that was supported by the grantee dollars that were invested were black folks. The majority of the members of the board of these organizations that were funded were black folks. So these are folks in the community. These are folks um, that are of and from the community that the organizations that are being invested in actually have power to determine the nature of the kind of programming that happens. Because I know a lot of what, what many of us see so we may see programs or we may see organizations that have a black face at the front of it. But what this data helps us to understand is that we're talking about black folks that are invested in every level and every area of the kinds of programs that we're funding. Additionally, 35.9% um, of year two grantees um, in many ways required the funding that, that BCYF provided um, because it constituted a, a large portion of their operating budget. So we're not just funding organizations that have a bunch of money, but in fact, many of the organizations that the youth fund is funded are organizations that really need those resources and may not have otherwise been able to operate their programs had the youth fund not been made available to them. So again, these are highlights. These are very important things that constitute tremendous progress in the arena of grant making. There's still a lot of work to be done. But the fact that we've been able over the course of three years to be able to get this to the point where we're able to proudly say that we have a portfolio that supports, um, you know, black folks and folks of color in this way is something that, again, Baltimore 
uh, both the council and the public should be proud of. This slide shows where the majority of youth are being served. What Davon talked about really was the importance of BCYF supporting community-based youth serving institutions that are proximate to the communities they serve. This is critical, that these organizations are rooted in community, they know community, they know that the community knows them and trusts them. Some organizations do serve youth citywide, but the majority of them specified we serve in this particular area. Now, the numbers on this slide address all of the youth that are served. And on the prior slide, when we talked about 20,000 plus youth that are served, we were talking about unique individuals. We may have youth that are served in more than one quadrant. But at the end of the day, you can see clearly that when the grant review panel made decisions about where to deploy and invest funding, that they did weigh and balance where organizations serve to ensure that it's not just youth in one neighborhood being served or youth over here, that it really was deployed throughout the city. So as you see here, um, this is just consistent with the highlight that we showed a couple of slides ago. This shows us that the majority of the organizations that are funded in terms of the leadership of those organizations are black led and are women. Um, and you see the breakdown again, this, this uh, breakdown is representative of the population of Baltimore City. Um, and again, we think this is important in terms of thinking about what portfolios should look like that are doing grant making in Baltimore City. So these slide look at distribution of funding. Um, and, and, and it's similar to the to the to the previous slide. It just puts the numbers all together. So you see, um, again, the percentage of organizations that are led by Black folks um, are are more representative of the city's population. And again, a majority of the leadership of the organizations that are funded um, are women. Additionally, we mentioned the workforce. Um, most most of the workforce that is funded are Black folks. Um, as you see on, on the, the left of the chart, um, you can see the majority of those that comprise the workforce, or most of the, the largest number, rather, of folks represented in the workforce of those organizations supported by the youth fund are Black women. Um, but we see that generally, if you take Black males and females together that um, combine, they compro comprise the majority of the workforce. would like to spend a little bit of time on this slide, um, really talking about what the portfolio looks like. The, there's a significant portion of grantees in this portfolio that have operating budgets under $100,000. We're talking on the smaller side. There are a handful of organizations that were much larger that received grants. And one of the things that we often talk about is Smaller organizations, if you are, if you have a $5,000 annual operating budget, your organization doesn't have any infrastructure. You have a program, but you're not private providing a lot of infrastructure on a budget that's small. Oh, please and don't there, do that. And there are times no, 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 watch that some of these programs need to partner with larger institutions in order to have that infrastructure that's required to manage public funds. There are a number of requirements that come with managing public funds that don't exist for those who receive private funding. BCYF is proud that we have been able to serve more than half of our portfolio with the annual operating budget under half a million dollars. So again, this is um, the chart that looks at board members. Um, so majority of those that serve on boards that were uh, organ of organizations that were funded by the youth fund are, are folks of color. And we find that to be uh, particularly important. And I alluded to this earlier. You know, one of the things that, you know, has been a point that we really stress is the importance of shifting power into the hands of those of from the community um, as, as it relates to institutions. So not just individual people um, who leading organizations, but also those that serve 
on boards. And as many of you know, boards are, you know, people who serve on boards wield a tremendous amount of power as to how many of these programs um, are operated, um, you know, the, the common practices and the like. Um, and so again, one of the things that we're proud of is the fact that many of the, that the majority of the um, folks that serve on boards that were funded by the youth fund um, are folks of color. Additionally, um, as we mentioned earlier, majority of board members are women. Um, it's fairly equally, um, you know, fairly equally balanced, um, which I think, again, signifies that our portfolio um, is representative of the population of Baltimore City. For some of our grantees, the grant from the Baltimore Children and Youth Fund really is the majority of their budget. That means they have not been invested in by other funders in the city. This is not about quality of programming. This is about who you have access to, who you are proximate to, what you're able to tap into. And so for a number of these organizations, this has been the first time that they've been funded or been funded to the amount that they have been. That this is really an investment in organizations that have for, in many cases, decades, been doing great work and never recognized by mainstream philanthropy. BCYF has been able to step in and support them in not only moving their program during this period of time, but also preparing them for what comes next, which is to figure out how to find additional sources of revenue and to manage it. This is part of the technical assistance piece. It isn't just you receive a grant dollar today that goes away tomorrow. That's the challenge of sustainability in the nonprofit sector. You receive a grant and then it's taken from you and you're expected to continue to operate. BCYF really has been working with grantees, one, to prepare them for this is going to go away at the end of the grant cycle, but how do you continue? How do you leverage the public dollars for private funds? How do you leverage your volunteers? How do you make adjustments so that you don't get into financial trouble when you have identified that there's going to be an end? And then to also support the organizations that are in the middle here, some of whom were actually able to step up and scale because of the funds they received from BCYF to help them to support, to support them in thinking about what is the next step. So again, I um, wanted to just so, show this slide again in, in, in concluding on some of the data that, that we've gone through. And as I mentioned in the beginning, we're gonna make publicly available even more data that gives more granular details about the organizations that were funded, um, and other kinds of information that are relevant in evaluating the portfolio itself. But I wanna stress that one of the things that we talk about the, the task force and we talk about many of the things um, that resulted in the idea that there need to be a dedicated fund for children and youth. You know, one of the things that was stressed is that community-based organizations and black leg organizations in particular, um, in many ways have been marginalized from the philanthropic sector. And that what we have been able to do in a short amount of time, um, with 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 certainly with challenges, but within a short amount of time, is to be able to produce a portfolio that is as diverse as any or more diverse than than, than many other portfolios of similar um, grant making um, size in, in operation. And one of the things that I want to stress is that there are lots of issues that the youth fund um, is trying to address in Baltimore as it relates to our children and youth. And in order to be able to maximize the impact of the Baltimore City and Children and Youth Fund, it's important that those of us that are evaluating the success and evaluating the impact of the Youth Fund are comparing it to other grant making institutions. Because there are lots of problems that the Youth Fund will be a part of helping to address, right? But it's important that we're clear that as a grant making institution, that what we've been able to do is be able to provide a model and that hopefully other grant making institutions will begin to change their portfolios to reflect the city of Baltimore in ways that it has not in the future. And on the score of having accomplished um, a, a portfolio that demonstrates greater access to resources, to community-based organizations, and particularly Black-led community-based organizations, the Youth Fund has accomplished that goal. And it's important that, again, this, this council um, and the public is proud of that. 
So now we're going to hear from um, some of the grantees that have benefited from the Baltimore City Children and Youth Fund. And first up is uh, Do More Baltimore. Ola Woods may need to be elevated or unmuted. Yeah, we're well, supposed to be. It's Monique Brown who is subbing in for Olu Woods. And if we're having, I cannot um, identify her on any list, Mister Love. Okay. Yes, ma'am. So do do we have? Uh, do we have um, Beadley? Do we have Dion Davidson from Beadley? Yes, I'm here. All right. Hello, everyone. I'm Dion Davidson from Beadley Speaking Jewelry, and my program is Beadley Speaking Kids. Our mission here at Beadley Speaking Kids is to promote wellness and confidence among young girls in Baltimore through jewelry making. Um, we envision a world where girls are empowered through the arts to feel more confident and to love themselves more fully. So we created a program based on um, my love for teaching. I used to be a Baltimore City um, first and second grade teacher. So I combined my love for teaching with my love for jewelry making and created a curriculum where we have dialogue while we make jewelry and we talk about important wellness and mental health issues. The impact of this program has been amazing, especially in the pandemic where children were um, locked in a lot. It gave them a chance to express themselves. And so our program having that vocal piece and jewelry making really helped some of the girls to come out of their shell and find their voices. An example of that is we had seven weeks of programming and on the eighth week, they had to do a show and tell, make pieces that they, um, you know, learn from information they learned throughout the program and come back and share that information with us um, on Zoom. And I was blown away by the amount of jewelry that the kids were able to make on their own using the skills that I taught them in the seven weeks. Um, another important piece was at the end of the program, they were begging me to continue. And I was, I was so amazed by that, just their enthusiasm. So with um, additional um, materials that were purchased through the BCYF um, grant, I was able to uh, give them three additional sessions of advanced classes, and they were so excited. One of the great things that came out of that was uh, I ordered beads, these pearls, and I didn't realize they didn't have any holes in them. So when I went to go teach the lesson on uh, a necklace class, there was no holes to do it. So I had to pivot. In the middle of showing them how to turn a bad situation into a good situation, one of the students sat there and created a wire um, cage to house the bead and created earrings. And that's exactly where I was going with it. She used that time and she did that on her own. And what it showed me is that the student became the teacher. And that is very pivotal in, the, in a time like this where a lot of kids are really shy and don't really know anything. So you had children who never made jewelry to now they're actually teaching their peers on Zoom how to make jewelry. I'm grateful for this grant. Um, because the level of support that I've received, I probably would not have been able to accomplish these things by myself. Having a TA, Julie Brooks, she is one of my biggest cheerleaders, making sure that all aspects of our program is um, running smoothly. And being new to this um, part of business, I wasn't sure about how to conduct the financials and making sure my reports were um, okay. And I'm very excited to know that I had somebody who was there for me to help me through that. So Hasana has been a blessing with the financial part and the narrative, helping me to put 
together what has happened in words to, that people can see that it's making an impact. Rashida has been amazing um, with helping with that. And more importantly, I would not have partnered with a fiscal sponsor had I not received this grant. And in doing so, I got a first eye view of what it takes to run a nonprofit. So I took a vision, a dream, and turned it into a program. And now we're working on becoming a nonprofit entity. And that's thanks to the fund. Um, I've applied for several grants over the years and I got rejected and I watched big companies get the big bucks to continue to do their work and not having the resources, the dollars to do it, I will volunteer. Sometimes not even having enough money to drive to these places to volunteer, but I kept doing the work. And so when I was chosen by um, the fund, I was really excited to know that jewelry making that I started as just helping my mom recover from brain surgery in 2004 became something that impacted the city. It wasn't just about my family anymore. Me teaching myself how to make jewelry became bigger than me. And I'm grateful for the opportunity. Like I said, especially in a pandemic where people were locked in, it gave them a, a, a creative outlet, something to do um, that lifted their spirits and helped these young girls to become not more, not just more confident, but more creative. Um, till this day, they still text me pictures, even though our program has ended. It texts me pictures of work that they're still doing. So the work doesn't stop. And I pray that we are we um, continue this because there are so many young programs like myself who are waiting for the opportunity, but don't know where they can secure those dollars to do the work. So I'm grateful for the opportunity to do the work. And hopefully I'll continue to receive more resources to continue the work in Baltimore because I'm proud to be part of Baltimore City. I'm a product of Baltimore City Public Schools. And to be able to give my community the person that I needed when I was a child has been a tremendous blessing and it's been rewarding. Thank you, real quick. Thank you, Ms. Davis. I appreciate it. Thank All right. you. So ne next we're going to go, we're going to actually go to African Youth Alchemy and then we're going to come back to do more. I think that's Nehemiah. Can everybody hear me? Okay. Sir. Um, yes, my name is Nehemiah Hall. I'm the administrator for African Youth Alchemy's uh, Real Works program. And um, African Youth Alchemy is a, um, started as a community based program um, pro uh, specializing in film, media, culture, education, and travel study. And um, for the most part, for 10 years, we were mostly. Um, most of the staff, most of the staff was volunteers um, working in schools um, under another program that we have called the Real South Program. And um, we wanted to do a program that kind of got young people in the community that were budding photographers and had some entrepreneurship skills and spirit. And we started the Real Works program two years ago um, in 2019. Um, throughout that program, we will meet weekly on Mondays and Thursdays. Students will learn film, photography, editing, um, graphic design, composition, the, the basic, um, the basic film entrepreneurship skills to develop a business and to gain a, uh, gain a, uh, job and a, uh, entry level position. And, um, our first year, 57% of our students earned money, uh, learned the skills that we taught them. And um, one of the students placed second in the National Drexel High School uh, Photo Festival. Um, impact, I mean, without BCYF funding, we would have never been able to um, have, because some of our funds, we take a media excursion to Ghana, West Africa. We would have never been able to do that freely as we've done um, without the funds of BCYF, give students stipends, have money for equipment, have money to pay students stipends to attend the programming and cover the travel costs. Um, uh, that that would have never been possible without BCYF. Um, also, I would like to 
turn the uh, mic over to two of our students uh, who are second year students, Corey Booker and uh, Sydney Perdi. I guess we can have, uh, since Sydney's already a panelist, could you go first, Sydney, and speak about uh, your experience, please? <clears throat> sure, hello, am, am I audible? Okay, um, hi, my name is Sydney Purdy. Um, like Nehemiah said, I am a second year student with African Youth Alchemy. Um, I am currently 25, I'll be 25 tomorrow. Um, and I am an educator in the Baltimore City school system. Um, I've been a part of the African Youth Alchemy program since 2019. I was one of the students to actually go to Ghana, West Africa. And um, quite honestly, the program was, well, it has been life changing. Um, I don't really think I really knew what I was signing up for when I found it in undergrad. Um, at that time, as a photographer, someone just looking for a creative outlet, but um, really and truly being a part of this program and learning photography, being able to travel to Africa, which is one of my like dream kind of places to um, just one of a dream goals since a, a little, little girl. But um, being able to do all of that and also learn how to build a business and have some success with that business. Um, has really been not only something that um, has tremendously helped my kind of budding adulthood coming out of college and growing into an independent woman, being successful on my own, but um, really changed my outlook on how I want to move. Um, again, as an educator, as someone who wants to teach and give back and share um, our true culture with the world, our African and indigenous culture with the world, um, thinking long term like that, I think being a part of this program um, has helped me kind of set myself up for success to where as though I can share some of this information with my little brother and other students that I'm currently working with in Baltimore City Schools as much as possible as a historian and educator. So. Um, I'm very, very grateful, and I owe so much to this program. So, thank you. And could we have uh, Corey still on? And I think um, after Corey, our executive director, Rashtra Sabiru, just joined. So, yeah, after Corey, he will go on. But, Corey, are you still on? Corey, un Corey Booker, you're unmuted. Can you can speak, Mr. Booker? All right, the Corey's Corey having Booker. trouble. Well, could we um, are you there, Corey? Well. Can, uh, Can we come back to Corey? Who is your next speaker? Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, Executive Director Rashtra Sabera. Can he be unmuted, please? Excuse me. I didn't get your name. Oh, it's Rashtra Sabera. I can type it in the chat. It's R A S T R E S U B R. Okay. Good evening. Can y'all hear me? Yes, we can hear you, Ross Trey. Okay. Yes, good evening. I'm Ross Trey Sabira, the Executive Director of African Youth Alchemy, or AYA Inc., as we, as we call it. Um, and we are an organization of social justice and media production organization um, that addresses issues of immediate relevance in the lives of Baltimore City youth through film, photography, and cultural education. Uh, the BCYF grant allowed us to launch a new program, which we entitled Griot Works, uh, which gave us opportunity to work with young people 16 to 24 years of age in Baltimore City, and to train them in photography, film, and entrepreneurship with the goal of, at the end of the program, them being able to start their own business or at least uh, and gain an entry-level position in a media production agency. Um, one of the other components of our program that is, uh, is uh, very much so 
at the forefront is the cultural, edu uh, cultural education and tribal study. And so the culmination of this program after the young people got the training of film and photography and were able to serve and connect with Baltimore businesses to um, help promote their um, business needs, uh, we were able to take the young people on a um, concluding journey to Ghana, West Africa, uh, which gave them the opportunity to not only use their skills to um, help a burgeoning economy in Ghana uh, realize its own creativity, but also uh, to impart them as, as cultural educators. Um, so when they come back to Baltimore City, can share um, the wide variety and you know just exceptional um, culture of, of the African diaspora uh, with the people that they come in contact. So uh, this grant was very instrumental in allowing us to you know, be very ambitious and step outside of the box and uh, really think in a, um, you know, action oriented way with young people. And so we were very appreciative and blessed um, to be awarded this opportunity and look forward to continuing to serve Baltimore City youth uh, to address issues in, of immediate relevance in their lives through film and photography. So um, thank you for the few short moments and uh, I'll yield back the floor. All right, and then our last uh, program uh, oh, is due I, I, Yeah, um, I just wanted to see some, um, to give Corey a chance. Corey, are you there who, now? Well, who is that speaking? Oh, this Mr. Hall? Yeah, I um, just wanted to see if he was still there. Mr. Booker, you should be able to speak now. Hello? We can hear you, Mr. Booker. Okay. Um, <clears throat> hello, my name is Corey Booker. I'm a current student in grad work in the grad works program, and I've been enrolled since year one. Um, during my time with the program, I gained a lot of experience in the media industry, and that really opened up a lot of doors for me. I had the opportunity to work with different Black-led organizations, such as Collectively, and I currently have a opportunity to work on an HBO series that's being filmed in Baltimore this summer. Um, GridWorks has really impacted my life in like a lot of great ways. We learned how to run like a media business and we're also granted the ability to start our own LLC. We also learned about, <clears throat> we also learned a lot about the African culture and had the opportunity to travel abroad to Ghana. There we learned the true African, we learned about the true African culture and the history of us as black people. My time in the program was really like a life-changing experience everything we learned was fortified with hands-on experience such as projects um going out taking quick photos and also guest speakers who are successful in the industry spreading that knowledge with us great works is just a really great program and i used all the skills that i learned every day in my life and i'm grateful just to be a part of this organization thank you Real quick, before we start, I, I wanted to thank um, this organization, but I want to just mention that Mr. Hall, I believe, came from Change For Real. I remember when he first started his his pictures and his recording down on Caroline Street. So, uh, Mr. Hall, I'm proud of you, man, and everybody on here, but I seen when you first started and you really elevated. So I just wanted to thank everybody and thank the instructor because media means a lot to us, especially the way we get uh, portrayed in the media now, we're going to show some good things and great things that our young black people, young men and women are doing in Baltimore City. So thank you. All right, thank you, Chairman. So we're going to go to the our last program, do more, um, and then proceed with the presentation. Good evening, everyone. Baltimore, Baltimore. Do More Baltimore's mission is to use arts as a tool to increase civic engagement in marginalized communities throughout greater Baltimore. Do More has used the arts of spoken word to help Baltimore's youth process their thoughts, feelings, and emotions while also engaging marginalized communities. And as you can imagine, this was even more important during the pandemic, especially at the onset. 
um, as opposed to simply responding to our writing prompt, our youth ask for a safe space to process their fears around COVID-19. That space was granted and our youth have blossomed and continue to thrive during the pandemic while still serving their communities and making time to process and deal with their feelings. BCYF has allowed us to increase capacity and establish new programming. At Do More, we amplify youth voice. And when our youth request new programming, we listen and we respond. So during the pandemic, we established a club that we affectionately called Poetry as Mental Health. And this club was created and is facilitated by our youth. And we partnered with the Black Mental Health Alliance to train our young people and our staff members. And since then, our young people have been invited to speak at workshops and lead workshops about their work through the Poetry as Mental Health and how they are connecting with other young people um, and serving as mentors. By providing a technical assistance team that shared their expertise and guided us through the reporting process, BCYF's structure has positively impacted our work and allowing us to build real capacity. BCYF is what is our major funder, so it is the majority of our operating budget. And as grassroots leaders, we're often busy with being boots on the ground and ensuring that we're making a positive impact on our community. So it was very helpful to have a technical assistant team like the one that BCYF put in place to help support us and ensure that everything was operating and moving smoothly with those, with those public dollars, especially when we had our physical sponsor being in constant communication with BCYF, it made for a smooth transition, made for a seamless reporting process. Oftentimes, grassroots organizations are overlooked by funders, um, as um, other folks have shared here. BCYF has been essential in helping grassroots organizations like Do More have access to funding that not only encourages us to build capacity, but provides the resources to build capacity, to grow, to make a major impact on our community. Being granted by BCYF will now put us in a position to leverage those dollars to seek other dollars. Um, it shows that we have been vetted by a major city and the initiative, and it shows that we are an organization that is truly here for the people and is working to ensure that Baltimore City is a, is a city that is growing and that is truly providing opportunities for our, for our youth to grow. We are truly grateful for the support of Baltimore Children and Youth Fund Grants because it has allowed us to continue serving as a creative outlet for our youth, but it has also allowed us to serve as a catalyst for change throughout Baltimore City. We thank you. Mr. Moore, is that it? Mr. Love, I'm sorry. Yeah, so then there, there's a, a video um, regarding just one, one last grantee, it's a short video. And then we're gonna, there's um, actually a few more slides that talk about like some of the finances and the transition. So I'll, we'll, we'll try to, we'll try to speak through some of that. Yeah, because we, we, real quick, we, we have some, I'm sure we have some public testimony and uh, some of my colleagues would like to ask some questions. Thank you. Yes, sir. Mr. Chair. Yes. Um, Councilman Torrance, I just want to take a point of personal privilege um, to start off my town hall, then I'll rejoin the committee. Okay, real quick. I think you got to step away. Am I correct? Yes, sir. Sure. Thank you so much. My name is Kevin Apperson. I've been in Reservoir Hill for the past 26 years. To me, St. Francis Neighborhood Center is, is part of the heart of Reservoir Hill. It's a safe place for children. It's a place for meeting, for gathering, for joining together. It's a place of joy. Hi, my name is Asia Ross. I'm in 11th grade. I am now 17 years old. Um, when I was in the fourth grade, and one day I came in and they were so welcoming. I enjoyed playing games, dancing, and doing yoga and having such a great time. And I knew at that moment when I walked through the doors, I was meant to be at the center. I've learned so much like leadership, how to be kind, acts of kindness, and about return and helping out the community. And when this venture is done, I'll be happy to help other kids, just like Miss Emily and Miss Christy did with me. I want to be a dancer when I grow up. When I grow up, I want to be a detective. When I grow up, I want to be a therapist. When I grow up, I want to be an inventor. When I grow up, I want to be a firefighter. St. Francis Neighborhood Center is a positive alternative. 
It's just knowing that my child My name is Alan Berkeley. I am a freshman at Morgan State University. We had uh, tutors that could help us with our homework. They helped me with my resume and my scholarships, which allowed me to go for the year without actually having to pay out of pocket. Thank you, St. Francis. Thank you, St. Francis. Thank you, St. Francis. All right, so now we're going to talk about um, what BCYF has been doing since its transition to be an independent entity. So as we've mentioned a few times, one of the things that BCYF does, it's a little bit different than some other funders, is really provide some support for grantees. Our grantees have been through a lot. They went through a pilot year, and then they went through everything shutting down because of COVID. And in the midst of that, they were told, okay, the youth fund used to be at Associated Black Charities, and now it's moving into an independent institution. What does that mean for you? Some of the people you used to talk to, you won't go to anymore. This is what it will look like on this side. Then there were some very specific things that need to be done when an entity changes. Things that seem minor, such as changing the additional insured on insurance. But if this isn't something that you do every day, this becomes really nerve wracking as you're trying to run a program in the middle of a pandemic while things are shutting down. So BCYF spent the first couple of months post July really working with grantees to help ease the transition from one organization to another. We'd also made some decisions in conjunction and with the permission of the transition board to ease some of the grant requirements to support the grantees. Funds were converted to general operating funds because we found that some grantees were not able to perform their programs as initially expected when schools and rec and park buildings and other facilities were, be, were open but they had converted to meet young people's emergent needs and sudden needs. You heard Dumor talk about poetry as mental health, how important that was, particularly during this time. There were some other programs that converted to virtual. Some programs really were about how do we ensure that young people have access to the day-to-day -day needs in order to just survive and thrive. So they had the flexibility to do that. The other thing that BCYF did was to extend the grant cycle for 90 days without grantees having to fill out additional paperwork. We know things have been slowed down. We know you may need a minute to pivot, to think about it, to work with your TA team to figure out how to make those adjustments, to adjust your budget, which still had to be approved by BCYF, to provide support during that time, and then to offer a second extension if they need it in order to continue programming. Because I think many of us found that the delays and the closures lasted much longer than expected. All of this was part of the continuation grant process with our grantees. So the first couple of months were spent supporting them directly in the transition and then resuming what you heard Diane talk about, which is to give them that holistic support of the narrative report, the financial report, and then the really just one-to-one -one TA specific about you. Finance and expense reporting is a compliance requirement. Narrative reports and site visits are a compliance requirement. We don't want this to be transactional. It really is about that third TA is, what is it that your organization needs that you need as a leader to be successful so that your program is sustainable so that you can continue to serve young people. One of the challenges in philanthropy is that organizations are afraid to tell the truth when they need support because there's always the fear that that funding is going to go away, that a funder is going to say, we're not going to support you anymore because you let us know that there are challenges. 
That's where BCYF really did work in sharing with grantees, we are here to help you. We can help you problem solve some of these things. And that's why they had these wraparound services. So that's how we've been working with the grantees since the transition. Then additionally, one of the things that I alluded to towards the beginning of the presentation is that while the uh, ordinance to authorize BCYF to be an independent entity was underway, the previous administration in recognition of the impacts of the pandemic saw it fit to um, utilize some of the resources from the Baltimore City Children and Youth Fund to deal with the issue of access to food and to deal with the issue of the transitioning to virtual learning and giving more access to the, the, to the tools and materials and computers um, needed for young people to participate in virtual learning. Um, it's expected that up to 15,000 people will receive you know, prepaid uh, debit cards in response to the emergency need um, in partnership with uh, Open Society Institute that administered the program. Um, and, we've, and so we found that to be particularly important as it relates to um, what's important for the council to know that the youth fund has both while doing the work of helping the programs that are funded in the portfolio continue their work, but also, also other ways that the youth fund contributed to an overall effort to respond um, to, the, uh, to the pandemic. Um, thank you, Mr. Love. I'm gonna just real quick, um, just, we were just gonna take public testimony. Um, for those who sign and use a computer, please use the raise hand function to indicate that you wish to testify. We will start with you and Ms. Kern. We'll pull from the list. Thank you. Well, I have two individuals that signed up. We'll start with Melissa, last name spelled S-C-H-O-B-E-R. Melissa? Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. When the youth fund was presented to voters in 2016, it was described as a sign of the full commitment of the city to its youth. Voters approved not just money, but an idea that the community could confront social inequity without lending more power to the usual philanthropic suspects. Five years later, there's a lack of transparency and urgency typified by this hearing, which is being held a full month after the deadline specified in the ordinance. We also see it in the transition board itself. Although the board is meeting for about an hour every other month, one of its eight members has been absent for every meeting between July 2020 and through January 2021. The bylaws contemplated in the ordinance are not publicly available. It has not issued an RFP, the first step in hiring an auditor, and has not hired an executive director, all tasks set to be completed in the first half of 2021, as per the board's own minutes. There is virtually no public accounting of fund dollars, no collected publicly available data on the demographics of those served nearly three years after the first grant award, nor is there specific data on admin or program costs. It's unclear if the transition board or its partners are conducting site visits, including of grantees that ABC failed to visit as per the city audit. Apart from a year one summary, there's nothing to account for fund expenditures over time. The year one process evaluation conducted by Andy E. Casey promised in 2019 has not been released. There are no formative or summative evaluations. A commitment to equity without a culturally vetted and participant oriented evaluation deprives the city and organizations of a critical resource necessary for the sustainability Ms. Ritter, re Ms. Ritter referenced. In the five years since the fund was approved by voters, we've seen a single RFP. We're funding largely the same orgs that we were in 2018. This reinforces the power dynamic in which a small group, the transition board, determines who is worthy of initial and ongoing support. Where are the new approaches to philanthropy that we were promised and how is this body exercising its oversight role to ensure we're building the capacity of nascent youth-led orgs through high quality TA? If we truly want to support youth, then this body must be actively engaged in the formation of a permanent entity that will sustain the funding of its grantees. It must not put up oversight hearings as it has done tonight and must not pretend that deadlines for financial plans and community needs assessments that begin in FY22, which specified in 2363, are niceties rather than the requirements fundamental to uplift our youth. They deserve no less. Thank you. 
Thank you. Sierra, next up is Sierra Huff. Ms. Hello. Huff, thank you. I said not that anyone can Hi. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes, Hello, we can. my name is Sierra Huff. Um, I am the executive director of Court Appointed Special Advocates or CASA for Children of Baltimore, not to be confused with Casa de Maryland. I started as a volunteer for CASA in 2014. I immediately fell in love with the mission and in 2019 decided to take on the role of the executive director. CASA Baltimore is a nonprofit organization that has been serving foster children in Baltimore since 1988. Its mission is to provide court appointed special advocates to speak for the best interests of abused and neglected children involved in Baltimore's juvenile court system, to encourage reunification, help them find a permanent family and reach their full potential. CASA receives court appointments from juvenile court, usually when the court considers the case to be complex and provides a unique service to victimized children in Baltimore City. CASA volunteers present facts and recommendations that are in the child's best interest to juvenile court, provide juvenile court with an objective and comprehensive report of the child and family situation throughout the entire court process, give individual attention to each child, providing individualized mentoring and advocacy for the child in an overwhelming child welfare system. CASA has a small staff of six that supports and supervises 75 volunteers. CASA volunteers come from all walks of life and are considered the eyes, ears, and friends of the court. We are the only neutral party involved with the foster child's case. In collaboration with the Department of Social Services, CASA shares information gathered about the child and the child's family and submits court reports at every child's hearing. CASA makes recommendations to the court for placement, permanency plan, visitation, and services and resources for the child and family. We want to ensure the family has all supports to prevent the child from re-entering foster care. According to the Kids, Kids Count Data Center of Annie E. Casey Foundation, as of February 2021, Maryland has 4,513 children in foster care and 1,836 children, nearly 41% are in Baltimore City. Last year, CASA served 120 children and youth. Of that 120, 114 were foster children and six were youth co-involved with the ju juvenile justice system. These youth were in prison or on house arrest. The average age was 14 and 82% were African-American. We've assisted with successfully closing 26 cases, 12 children were reunified with their family, 11 youth aged out at 21 years old with independent living arrangements, and three children were awarded custody and guardianship. Today, CASA serves 109 children, and we have 12 children on the wait list, which includes two youth co-involved with the juvenile justice system. The number of cases juvenile court appoints to CASA is steadily increasing, and the cases are more complex. There are more children co-involved with the juvenile justice system, which makes placement and permanency planning more difficult for the Department of Social Services. Uh, there are more pregnant foster youth, youth with substance abuse issues, and youth with severe mental health issues. Last month, CASA started strategic planning with an independent consultant to create and help implement a three to five year plan to improve services to provide it to our children and to improve relationships with stakeholders. Additionally, I intend to use the strategic the strategic plan to expand CASA because of the new foster care trends. It is time to make CASA available to all foster children before the court deems a case complex. Things could be complex for the child way before the court even considers the case to be complex. Now we have to be proactive rather than reactive. Just three weeks ago, I received a CASA appointment order from juvenile court and the court order mentioned a 16 year old boy who, was, who has been in foster care since he was seven he asked the court for a CASA. This was a first. In the perfect world, every foster child will have a CASA, but until then, I want to make sure that CASA can make the world of a foster child a bit better. Thank you for allowing me to share my passion with you, and I hope CASA can help decrease the number of children in foster care long term, assist with swiffer relative placement, and decrease the overall number of children and youth in foster care. It was a pleasure to hear how the Baltimore Children and Youth Fund has assisted community organizations and how other community organizations are serving our children and youth. And I plan to reach out to those 
that can provide services or an outlet for them. Thank you. Thank you. To all attendees who signed in using a computer, please use the raise hand function to indicate that you wish to testify. Right now, there are no hand raise functions on the attendees list. So I'm going to go to the ones who called in through the phone and come back to see if anyone else raised their hands. The first caller, do you wish to testify? Hello? Caller, in, uh, did you wish to testify? Okay. Well. Okay. Corbin Green. Good evening. Good evening. So um, I want to testify for St. Francis Neighborhood Center. Uh, we are in Reservoir Hill and we serve right now about 75 students. Uh, the majority, I'd say 98% are African American. And we serve the Reservoir Hill and Penn North area. Uh, right now we're in the middle of a capital campaign to expand because we were busting uh, from the seams of our small little brownstone building um, so right now the construction is about 60 percent done and uh with that growth we've you know we've we've have a teen intern program that is completely funded by baltimore youth fund and they're doing amazing things having um, town halls. There's one coming up for human trafficking that is going to be presented in front of the women's giving circle. And it is youth led. Uh, so I just want to put my hat out there for, you know, our grassroots community, um, community based program that is we're very small with a staff of nine, but we have a huge reach throughout Baltimore. And I feel like that we are we're a good model to show uh, what we can do to reach out to the youth and families in that area. Thank you. Thank you. Mary Alexander. Mary Alexander. Uh, how you all doing? Um, I took myself off mute. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes, we can. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm the director of Unique Fabrics. I've had a um, grant, a BCY grant, BCYF grant for two years. And um, I, this is for the board, um, specifically Ms. Cartwright. And, um, I would like to see more communications as to when the board meetings are. Um, I've only seen one communication that was the first one and I did attend that one myself and with us working so much in the um, in the field I would like to see more communications from you all especially about tonight I wish that you all had sent a follow-up email about tonight I wish that I have had if I would have had a chance to also present maybe you know you all had who you wanted to present tonight to the city council but my program is working in east baltimore and around really around baltimore because my emphasis is on youth works and becoming a youth work sites and i start um youth jobs um workshops and job readiness workshops um in january to get the kids ready but the one thing i want to see is that board grow and i would love to be able to serve on that board if at all possible i think i don't know how your your board um articles are written but now that you've had at least two years worth of um, people in the community um who have been grantees i think the board would be more receptive and work better if some of the members of the board actually benefited from the grant itself and we would probably bring a little bit more um, understanding from our point of view because everything was not so smooth, did not run so smoothly, and um, it was a little bit of frustration for some of us. Thank you very much. 
Um, real quick, um, Mr. Love, do we have the caller's information so we make sure she gets the information? Yeah, um, so yeah, okay. I think uh, the caller is a green tea, so we'll, we'll certainly uh, make sure to reach out. All right, thank you. Mr. Chair, that concludes public testimony. Back to you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, um, um, Mr. Love and your staff and the presenters and the um, panelists. But I wanted to say I looked at the funding and how it's spent um, and how it's used because we do a lot. We know our young men have some issues we have to address here in Baltimore City, but I'm glad to see we're addressing some of the, the young ladies also in this funding source because I've been hearing that a lot and I'm sure my colleagues do too. They think it's all for our young men. We got to make sure we um, address some of it, help our young women here in Baltimore City. So we are going to start with the committee members. I know Councilman Zeke Cohen had to step away. He wanted to come back and I uh, wanted to know if he's still on. Yep, still here, Mr. Chair. Um, let's say it's let me see what time it is. I know it's 6.24. Um, can we, um, if we do two questions per council person, can we make sure we, you know, be conscious of everybody else is on here so we can make sure everybody get their questions answered also? Thank you. Uh, Councilman, you can start. Great. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, <clears throat> thank you to all the organizations that we heard from tonight to the staff and the board of BCYF um, have to shout out former Mayor Young and Lester Davis, who helped create the fund. Um, and just to say, um, and then I'll get to my two questions, Mr. Chair, I do want to say that what you all have endeavored to do is incredibly hard. I think it's to your great credit that you've been able to actualize this vision of a participatory partly youth-led, racially just vehicle to reimagine philanthropy and invest in overlooked, primarily black and brown-led youth-serving organizations. And I realize that in a town where many of the philanthropic and political crosswinds have often blown in a different direction, that is a hard nut to crack. I know that a lot of great work has been done by grassroots organizations that would not have happened without the youth fund. Men many entities have received coaching, technical assistance, and capacity building support that has been critical. And I think we still have a ways to go in improving transparency, reporting minutes as part of the Open Meetings Act, and establishing stronger systems of governance. Because it is taxpayer money that is funding the work, it is a very high standard of accountability for how those dollars should be spent and, of course, be reported on. But let me be clear. Under the current leadership, I have seen no indication of corruption. So that said, my two questions. One of the original parts of the ordinance that established the youth fund called for a third of the board to be young people. Um, it's been a particular passion of mine, as Mr. Love and others know. Um, there was some debate about what the age cutoff should be, but the in original intent, um, which I ended up writing it, was to include high schoolers and below in helping to manage the fund and really to teach them the skills, the expertise, the um, racial justice analysis to be able to do effective grant making. Can you talk about how young people are being engaged in the work of governance and distributing funds from the youth fund? And are we on track to have one third of the board seats be occupied by youth? So thank you for that question, Councilman. Um, let me first start off by saying that um, we have more to present to you all that will provide some of the information that you that you mentioned in terms of greater transparency and access to information to the public. And as you as you rightly point out, um, taking public dollars is a very high standard in terms of the level of transparency that it requires. Um, and so, you know, any anything that people perceive as lapses in that is not, as you again rightly state, is not out of an unwillingness to share information. It's an organization that's both managing a 78 organizational portfolio, building up the infrastructure to do some future grant making, and trying to do work in the interim to meet short-term needs. To your question, um, as you mentioned, the ordinance requires that a third of the board be youth. 
one of the things that you and I have talked about is that one of the problems with, with from my perspective, and I think the organization, you know, folks on this call would agree, that much of the youth leadership or youth led landscape has made the mistake of not properly training youth to be able to fully participate in the leadership positions that we want youth to be able to participate in. So one of the things that we've actually discussed is the youth fund developing a kind of leadership pipeline infrastructure that could both empty into training young people that could potentially serve on the board, as well as also being a clearinghouse for other leadership positions that require youth. And we wanna do that with anti-racist practices in terms of making sure that young people are able to fully participate, making sure that young people have an understanding of the community and the landscape from which they're operating. Um, and so that's something that the youth fund intends to do both again as, as a way to live up to what the ordinance requires, but also to fill a need that I think exists around the city, which is again, making sure that youth from the communities most directly impacted by white supremacy, poverty, all these other forces, to make sure that they have the proper training and support needed to be full, not to just be tokens, because we don't want young people to be tokens on these boards and, and, and it's real fiduciary responsibility. And that's one thing that is also important. Like we're talking about giving you know, young people real fiduciary responsibility that has you know, really important implications. So these are things that we wanna make sure that young people have the training they need to actually execute that fiduciary responsibility responsibly in a way that they can be productive. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman. Appreciate it. Real quick, if, if I could, Mr. Chair, um, just a quick response. Um, and, and I do appreciate that, uh, Mr. Love, and, you know, not tokenizing our youth is critically important as we go through this process and making sure that, to your point, they are true fiscal agents of this fund. Um, my, my push and my hope is that we are truly moving to a point where, again, one third of the board, as it states in the ordinance, are young people um, and, you know, they, they are fully trained up and ready to go and can be the future grant makers and the better grant makers of our city. So, again, would hope that we are accelerating that process, have been excited to hear you say that that is something um, that's being worked on. Just hope that, you know, within um you know, a, a reasonable amount of time we're working to attain that goal. Yes, sir. Thank you, Councilman. Appreciate it. Um, yeah. You have one more question, Councilman? Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so to talk about sustainability real quick, I know that, uh, and thank you, Kira and others for the presentation, year one and year two funds have gone out. Um, and that there's been a slight pause on year three, I believe, as we're trying to figure out um, what that next grant cycle looks like. I know that several organizations received uh, substantial funding um, to the tune of several hundred thousands of dollars. Um, and Kira, one of the things you mentioned was that for many organizations within the fund, the funding from the youth fund represents the majority of their budget. How we are how are we thinking of transitioning organizations off of that money, assuming that we're not going to keep them in perpetuity? Because my assumption is that we want new grantees to come through. Can you talk about what that sustainability piece looks like? Because to me, it presents, presents a potential challenge if an organization is like 60% BCYF money, and then all of a sudden that money goes away, we know what's likely to happen and it's not good. So can you talk a little more in detail about how we're helping to transition both large and small organizations off of what I believe is really substantial funding for them? Uh, before, Mr. Law, before you start, can we, um, we, we got like a half an hour, so we have other council people that have questions. So can you make it as short as you can? Thank you. One of the first things that we did, it really is about extending the grant cycle. What we didn't want were grantees returning millions of dollars at the end of the grant cycle simply because they didn't have time to spend it. Because there was a finite end that was already decided. That's number one. Number two, part of TA, we talk about this with this pod you heard people talking about, 
is, does that particular grantee have a question around sustainability that may not exist everywhere? But really the answer to this question starts on the front end, which is how do we have a conversation about what grant making should look like so that you're not at the end pulling the rug out under from organizations? That's really part of the ecosystem conversation of how is grant making done? BCYF, because of the sense of urgency and the response to that, did not talk about sustainability before we deployed funds in year one. This has to be a conversation before we move into year three to talk about what does it really mean to invest? What does sustainability really mean? At the end of the day, if you give a grant and you take it away, you've left a gap. And many of these grassroots organizations, quite honestly, have learned to function with duct tape and string. We don't want to continue to perpetuate that harm. And that is why we need to be thoughtful before we just do another open call for applications and dole out money again. Thank you. Um, Thank you, Karen. Thank you. Um, appreciate you indulging my questions and appreciate the work. Thank you, Councilman. Um, our next speaker is Councilwoman Middleton from the 6th District. Thank you, Mr. Um, Chair. And uh, and I also want to thank the um, team of uh, Davon, Cara, um, and Dion, and, uh, and all the people that um, basically was a part of this presentation. It, it was a really good, detailed, um, organized presentation, and um, really appreciate the, the update as you're moving forward. So my two questions, um, I noticed that you really kind of included the, the racial equity piece in your presentations and uh, wanted to know why and, and share with the public why it is so important for the youth of Baltimore to, um, uh, you know, to make sure that the youth fund um, money is given to black organizations and why it's important to incorporate uh, race of leaders, you know, and, and, and how it matters if um, kids are being, as kids are being served. Thank you for that question. Um, you know, the two things that I want to say to that quickly, the first is that, um, you know, anyone who reads data around youth development, um, the research is clear that folks that are closer proximity to the communities that young people come from, um, that they're more able to be successful in executing any kind of program. And that's something um, that I think is true across the board. I think that's something that Baltimore as a city is just starting to deal with as a mainstream issue that people deal with in public. Um, and so that's a big part of why it's important for us to make sure that we're making it accessible for black organizations to be able to receive dollars because that in and of itself, not by itself, but it's something that contributes to the effectiveness of people being able to deliver a particular program. And then just secondly, um, quickly, is that there are approaches to youth service that would not otherwise be lifted up if organizations that are led by folks in the community are not given access and and i think when we when we look at you know the the proximate fields of work that do work in the community whether it's social work public health public education we're seeing a reckoning where many of them are looking to cultural responsive pedagogy and race equity um, in those institutions to improve their practice and so we hope that the youth fund can serve as a resource because i think oftentimes people who receive money uh, particularly in the community, are seen primarily as recipients of services. We see folks in the community as being able to possibly contribute to the practices that shape, mold, and develop young people. And so we think that this portfolio represents folks in the community that can contribute to a best practice that has traditionally been excluded from the mainstream in these industries that serve you. Thank you for talking about that in a little more detail. And then the second question, uh, why do you think that BCYF is under more scrutiny than other grant making institutions. I mean, I think to be honest, um, and, I, and I'll speak to this briefly, um, and if Kira wants to weigh in, you know, this is a team that's majority black folks on this team, right? These are folks, many of us from Baltimore, you know, or spent a lot of time here in Baltimore, have deep ties here to Baltimore. 
Um, and this, this is an attempt to build an institution that is controlled by folks who are other from the community and hold ourselves accountable to the community. And that's a threat to a, to a philanthropic sector that's not used to us having that kind of power. And often attempts at our community gaining power is often met um, with notions of inherent pathology, notions of black inferiority. These are things that are whispered in private and that are insinuated in, in, in the media. Um, and it's something that we, we see this as taking up the challenge to demonstrate that the community actually can lead something that's gonna have a positive impact on the community. And I think this is one of those projects, there's no white savior, right? There's no white person that's sponsoring this to, to, to shepherd forward. And this is a city, as a majority black city. We need more narratives that show that as a community, we can build institutions that can meet the needs of our communities. Thank you. I, I didn't know if Kara was going to add something I, or she was just shaking her head to go green. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Hello? Thank you, Hello. Mr. Chair. You Hello? Hello? Yes. Okay, my computer just did a restart. So our uh, next speaker is um, Councilman James Torrance after Councilman Torrance. Uh, Councilwoman Felicia Porter. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I have two brief questions and then I'll save my third question, which is more about accountability for the second round because Councilwoman Middleton got to that question a little bit and I have follow up to that. But the first question is because I've noticed on your slides that you've had 70, I think 76, 77 or 79 organizations. I just want to make sure we understand for the public's knowledge why the numbers are different um, so that they're aware of why. And additionally, my other question to you is looking more deeper into what happens next after you have your lessons learned and how you're preparing to roll those out publicly and transparently. Because one of the things for the scrutiny that you're under, it ha one of the things I've heard from persons who are constituents is how do what are your lessons learned from the previous organization? What do you learn from taking over and how you're going to transition in a more transparent way? Even I can take the first part. So this is about data and validation of data. And so we have conversations with grantees. A lot of times we'll ask questions through a variety of ways. Sometimes it's a survey. Sometimes it's in reporting. And simply because you've asked the same question to a full portfolio of grantees doesn't mean everyone is answering the same question. And so at times when you look at the data and you validate it, it may be that there are only 76 organizations that either answer the question or answer the question that you were asking. And so that's why you'll see some differences and that's why we actually included the number so that people did not assume that it is the full portfolio when you're this large one or two grantees not answering doesn't really make a significant shift. But we want to acknowledge that it was not the entire portfolio that necessarily answered a question. We have 78 grantees who were funded in year one who received a continuation grant. There was one grantee who in year one was named an awardee by the grant review panel. But as we talk about the ecosystem, their fiscal sponsor could not meet the compliance requirements and we were not able to deploy those funds. So they were an awardee, but they never received a grant. BCYF does not believe in leaving that, that, that program behind simply because their fiscal sponsor failed to meet a responsibility. We were able to support them over the course of that first year in connecting with another fiscal sponsor that knows how to support grassroots organizations. And then they were funded in this round two. So it's 78 continuation grants plus that one organization that was not able to complete the process in year one. To your second question, Councilman, and it's a lot, actually a bunch of what you asked is in the additional slides of the presentation that we haven't been able um, to get to. I'll address just a few of those points. Um, the first is that, um, we wanted to use this hearing as an opportunity to present a lot of information about what has happened with the youth fund. Um, you know, some of the data about the grantees and the work that the youth fund has done. We wanted to use this as an opportunity to roll that information out to the public and the, and the public should expect more communications uh, from this point on around many of the questions that the public rightly should ask. 
So this includes, and what's actually in the presentation that we'll make available to the council and to the public, has the financial, the financial breakdown of, of where money was spent, um, additional information about what we plan to do moving forward, um, and, and just descriptions of the kinds of work that's been done under the Baltimore City Children and Youth Fund. Um, in terms of, of, of learnings, you know, one of the things that we learn, and this kind of uh, relates to one of the things that Kira mentioned, is that in order to get money deeper into the community, we need to invest in the infrastructure necessary to get resources out. So Dion Davidson mentioned um, the fiscal sponsor. And the importance of the fiscal sponsor was in getting resources um, to, to her program. Um, and so one of the things that the youth fund is looking to do um, is some partnerships um, with organizations. One of our partners, Fusion Partnerships, um, which has been one of the fiscal sponsors that our grantees have utilized, we're looking to do some thought partnership and some investment in Fusion Partnerships as a way to invest in an in, in, in institution that can help the organizations that it supports many of the organizations and supports that deal with youth have the infrastructure it needs to be able to answer some of these sustainability questions and to help provide more of the services and expand the ecosystem of services needed to properly to properly serve uh, of young people. And so, and, and I guess the last thing I'll just say on this question, again, it's a lot. And like I said, we'll make this presentation available to the public shortly. But one of the things that we learn, and it, it seems really simple to say it this way, but I think it's important to say, it's just really hard getting money into the hands of the community. You know, just all the things that particularly public dollars, you know, in terms of getting the insurances that are necessary, you know, being able to provide the technical assistance, the evaluation, you know, to help in the compliance. It's just a lot of work to be able to get money into the hands of the community. And so that's going to help us inform the institution and how we're able to effectively execute on the charge of the EFU fund, which is to get hands into community based organizations. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to yield back to the chair to give um, Councilwoman Porter a chance. Thank you, Councilman. Your kindness. Thank you so much, um, Mr. Chair, and thank you so much um, to my colleague, Council Councilman Torrance, my fellow Towson University grad, along with Davon Love and Adam Jackson. Just want to shout y'all out. Um, my my first question um, dealt with sustainability. Uh, Councilman Cohen um, spoke to that, but I, I just want to share that when we're talking about sustainability um, within the philanthropic community, I also think that we need to really leverage consolidations of nonprofits um, based on their mission in, in order to enhance the capacity um, of the organization and also the, the reach and, and breadth of the organization as well. So I hope you all are considering that um, in the conversations with some of the smaller nonprofits, given we have such an oversaturation of nonprofits here in Baltimore City. Um, my second question has to do with the um, the 15,000 people um, expected to receive the 400 prepaid um, cards that you all had mentioned. I wanted to talk through um, what that what the sustainability of that type of um, post COVID-19 pandemic assistance looks like. I think that you highlight, um, I think it was Kira in the presentation, you highlighted a major point um, related to the leveraging of city agencies and the co coordinated impact and effort of city agencies as it relates to uh, how we are, um, how we're handling the pan like post pandemic assistance. And so um, can you share some of your sustainability connections that you all um, with the BCYD are using and leveraging along with other city agencies and along with other larger nonprofit partners in the city of Baltimore to, uh, to sustain those types of um, pandemic assistance, particularly with housing and workforce development and healthcare. So just just three things quickly. The first, um, just to reiterate both to the council and the public, is that the youth fund um, is ten months old as an institution. So we're still in the on the piece around interagency collaboration. We're still very early on um, in being able to establish those connections. Two, on the question of the uh, prepaid uh, debit cards. So the youth, we didn't administer that. That was something that when the ordinance was passed last year. Um, that what the youth fund did was provide access to the resources to carry out that program, but it was really the previous administration um, mm -hmm. that was responsible for designing and executing. Um, and of course, the current administration is uh, executing, um, extending on the work the last administration had structured um, in terms of administering that program. So beyond just providing the resources for it, 
the youth fund is uh, has been responsible for um, that. And then I just want to speak briefly um, to the sustainability piece. Kira mentioned that uh, much of the TA that grantees have uh, been provided is on the question of thinking about how to sustain their organizations. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that the TA um, assistance has helped many grantees do is to help them in structuring their narratives um, that allow them to be able to get access to more funding opportunities. We also did a TA series um, earlier this year with a brother named Kendrick Stanley um, to help um, not just grantees, but it was free TA, TA for the general public to think about alternative revenue streams. Mm -hmm. So not just grant dollars, but what are other ways to generate revenue for organizations to be able to be sustainable? Um, and we found that to be particularly important. Thank you so much, um, Mr. Love, for, for sharing that. Um, I just want to caveat, you know, with the and even even with the administration of the prepaid cards, it, it would I think it would serve um, the, the nonprofits or grantees that you all are working with um, to serve those type of gaps that that will be forthcoming within you know the first one to two to five years post pandemic, and that will provide a, a a niche area that can can better kind of like support this whole grassroots led philanthropic movement that that we're we're trying to produce here in Baltimore. So that concludes my questions. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councilwoman. I believe Councilman Bullock was on. I don't know if he's still on. If he Councilman Bullock, are you still here? Okay, um, Councilman Mark Conway, do you have any questions? Yes, I do. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so I've got one question, excuse me, I'm, I'm juggling a little one, uh, speaking to children. Um, so I, I really appreciate the, the presentation. I actually learned a lot in sort of understanding how it all went through. Um, it, the, the question that I had, well, one, I want to commend you guys for all the work that you're doing, um, making sure that we're equi equitable in the distribution of the resources. I can tell you as a former nonprofit, nonprofit executive, it's really, 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 really hard to get that money um, and really hard to, to, to raise up to, to the challenge as well. And the paperwork can be nuts. Um, so I can appreciate that. Um, so the, the, the question that I have um, speaks to um, Devon, the, uh, the theory that you spoke to, uh, which I think you're right. Um, when we distribute the money to, um, to organizations that represent the community, um, how are we tracking the outcomes? How are we making sure that we're seeing the returns that we wanna see, um, as opposed to you know, traditionally the way that money is distributed uh, to the organizations that have the infrastructure and so on and so forth, that are a little distant from the community, uh, but have the better infrastructure to stand up and, and to follow through on the paperwork and otherwise. Do we do we have those outcomes? Can we speak to to um, that data? And 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 if not, um, is that something we can begin to collect to speak to to the impact? Uh, you want me? You want to start? Want me to start here and then you follow up? Yep, I'll jump in when you finish. So, so a couple of things. Um, one is is that one of the technical assistance that's been provided to grantees, um, uh, the Vera Group, um, that specializes in approaches to helping grantees develop metrics um, to to figure out how to characterize the impact they've had that their, their program has had in a way that connects to their own vision of what they want the work to be. I think too often in the philanthropic sector, you know, donors and elites within the sector have imposed on the community what its metrics should be. And so we've encouraged the grantees in thinking about how to um, ask for and do evaluations of their, of their programming to think about the kinds of metrics that really help them to articulate the impact um, that, that they've had. Um, as Kira mentioned, um, the second, uh, the continuation grant, the year two is closing out. So, you know, there's still reports coming in, um, but the youth fund does plan on being able to do a more rigorous analysis um, of the impact that the grantees have been able to have based on the reports that we have. It's just, again, reports are still coming in um, and programs are still um, engaged in doing the work. 
one of the lessons also that we learned from the year one grantees, um, we knew that there was really a demand and a desire to learn more about evaluation. We had standing room only during community based TA sessions in advance of the application process in year one for evaluation. We held sessions. They were standing room only on a Saturday afternoon in the middle of summer. That tells you there's a desire to learn. And what we found is that when we looked at metrics for the grantees, yes, to what Davon said, oftentimes funders tell you this is what you should count. But what we identified was this is an area where we need to spend more time with grantees to have them think about their program. Think about what the impact is for them to understand that this is really about them and not about a compliance or a box checking exercise for the funder. Because we found that some grantees wanted to have 100% of everything. And we know that not, it never goes perfectly. So when people are reporting 100%, that tells us something. We spent more time with the grantees in the continuation grant and sitting down and talking about these things. But just like I talked about sustainability cannot be a conversation that you have mid-grant cycle, this is not something you do after a call for applications has already been initiated. You talk about it in advance and you say, this is how we're going to sit down. And Councilwoman Porter talked about how we tie into other agencies. BCYF does not want to play small ball. We're, we're only looking at what does this particular grantee want to do, but what are the big problems that we want to solve? And how does this grantee support solving that big issue? And what are their particular metrics so that we can say, this is what BCYF did to address these particular issues. That's part of the transition year and why we've been so adamant that we should not just be deploying funds because there's a short-term desire to push money out the door, but to really take this time and talk about how does BCYF support big shifts? How do we support actually solving challenges that hundreds of millions of dollars have been thrown at and the problem still exists? That's what this critical year is about. Thank you and thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, before we go to uh, Councilman Burnett, uh, Burnett, Councilman, are you still on the phone? Councilman Burnett? Okay, there was uh, something in the chat, and it says, how do you determine, this for the Mr. Love and Ms. Ritta, how do you determine this percentage of board members, the executive director, the frontline staff? That was the question. So can anybody answer that? I'll just I'll just say that a part of why we provide the data that we did in the presentation to show both um, black led organizations in terms of the, the leadership, but also in terms of the board composition. Um, we have no that, that that's something that I think is under contention as to how you characterize what is truly a black led organization. There are a variety of ways for people um, to characterize that. So that's why we provided the information that we did um, in order for people to make those, you know, to help people kind of make those assessments for themselves. Okay, um, Councilman Burnett, you must have stepped off. I, I have, uh, I guess, maybe one or two questions. My question is when, when you, there were some of the criticism they, they came before this of youth fund was, they felt like some of the organizations that actually been doing the work um, in the black community felt like they were not selected. And the second one was there were organizations that are actually saying that put in funding twice and were funded twice, but it was the same organization. Have y'all this time looked at that and how you address those issues that were um, the concern of some of the um, uh, um, applicants? So I'll address the first question. Um, so when the initial RFP was put out in the summer of 2018, um, there were $75 million worth of requests to the youth fund. One of the things that we've stressed is that this is a portfolio that has made more money available to black organizations um, than many peer grant making institutions. But given that there were $75 million worth of requests, and there were just under $10 million available to give to organizations. This means one in seven organizations that apply 
or not going to get funded. And I think much of the frustration that people express as a result of that is warranted frustration because of the way the sector has continued to marginalize the kinds of applicants that see themselves as worthy recipients of the youth fund. And we, over the past couple of years, have had to have hard conversations with folks that we would say deserve funding. But again, there was $75 million worth of requests. And you know, it, we, we can't say that this should be a fund that only Black-led organizations are funded, right? That's just by law. That's not something that the youth fund is able to do. But I think that it's important for the public to know that in terms of the portfolio of the youth fund, it is as representative of the population of Baltimore City um, as some of the best portfolios that you're going to see here in Baltimore and around the United States. So my next question is, there was an organization I know of that um, put in a request twice from the same organization. And I looked at that as, you know, that, that could have been another organization that you were just talking about that didn't get funded. So did y'all look at that different to make sure the same group don't apply for two different funding sources from the youth fund? Thank you, Councilman Stokes. Appreciate the opportunity to talk about this. There are a couple of ways that this happens. One is if there is a fiscal sponsor, that is actually the grantee. And so there are fiscal sponsors that support more than one program. We talked about Fusion. In the past, we've talked about Strong City. Sometimes they support 12 or 13 programs, so they may be listed multiple times. Sometimes there are smaller fiscal sponsors that may be listed more than once because they serve as the infrastructure for a smaller organization that could not manage the funds on their own or didn't have a 501c3. The other way, and I believe there are two instances in which this happened, is an organization may put forward more than one proposal. And the grant review panel says, okay, we think this is great work. We're going to award one grant, but you must run both programs. And the majority of grantees actually will partially fund it so there are a couple of organizations that were told you submitted two applications, we're going to give you one grant, but you must do both. What BCYF did, we talked about, you know, lessons learned and how we adjust in the future. Sometimes we listed just the fiscal sponsor. Sometimes we listed that one organization, but the two programs and listed them separately. Sometimes we put it together. We will be more consistent. This is a piece of feedback that I received from one of the grantees, sorry, from one of the organizations that applied that was not successful, what she said was she zeroed in on the parent organization that actually received the grant rather than the program. She said in future years, she should put the program first because she was distracted by this is a large entity not realizing the money is actually going to a community-based organization that needed a fiscal sponsor and that large organization is serving in that role. So that's something that we will clarify in the future as we list our grantees, what's the difference between the program and the actual organization that is legally responsible and has the fiduciary responsibility. Um, thank you, um, real quick, um, the Love, can you make sure those questions that I actually emailed to you and those additional questions, make sure the council, every council person get a copy of those answers. My second one, we don't have, I guess that no more public testimony. Um, this vote will not, there will be no vote taken for this oversight hearing. So I want to actually thank you, Mr. Love, Ms. Cartwright, Ms. Ritter, um, the panelists, the presenters, and, and I'm glad you addressed some of the concerns and, and the, just the update. And to my colleagues who had great questions, I'm sure they have a better understanding of how the whole U Fund operates. And um, again, thank you for all the hard work that y'all do. I know behind the scenes is a lot of work. We don't, we're not always there to see it. Because this council seat, my colleague can say it's a lot of work too. We might make it look easy, but it's, it's a lot of work and I understand it. So, Thank you for attending. Everybody is hearing this hearing is recess and everybody have a great day. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Chair.